um, to uh, to assist in in his training. He later became um, a surgeon, uh, who had a very very uh, busy uh, practice in surgery. Amongst others, he was the surgeon to the royal family. Um, he was also uh, in leadership positions in many sort of surgical societies, academic um, colleges, uh, uh, hospitals and training faculty. So he, he held many, many, many um, uh, leadership uh, positions uh, during, his, during his life. Um, he, together with uh, um, together with Rudolf Verko, uh, I think he's the 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 German gentleman um, responsible for the Verko node. Uh, they were basically the pioneers of of pathology as we know it or part of pathology today by looking at, at tissue and specimens under the microscope. Before their time pathology was basically macroscopic description of, of things. So, so they really uh, started looking at, um, at tumors under, uh, under the microscope. One last interesting thing about him was that he also had a, a keen interest in crime trials. Um, and there was a trial where uh, a woman was on trial for murdering her husband um, because they on, on the post-mortem they found liquid chloroform in his stomach. Um, and she was put on trial and accused of, of, of his murder. Um, and um, she was acquitted because apparently if you swallow liquid paraffin, uh, liquid chloroform, it, it burns the, the, um, the esophagus uh, a lot and, and you would scream and shout and apparently this uh, gentleman who, who died did not. So, so the lawyer for, uh, for the accused argued that that uh, it was actually suicide, and she was she was acquitted. And the scientist that James Paget was after she was acquitted, and and this is a, a quote that he uh, is well remembered for. He said, "Now that she's been acquitted for murder and cannot be tried again, she should tell us in the interest of science how she did it." So. Um, so in 1874, he, uh, he um, noticed nipple ulceration asso associated with underlying uh, breast cancer. And there the first connection was made between Paget's disease of the breast and, and underlying breast cancer. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, extra memory Paget's of the penis and scrotum was uh, described by a gentleman with the name of Crocker and in the early um, 20th century, just at the start of the 20th century, um, a, a Frenchman whose surname I can't pronounce um, first described Paget's disease of the vulva. So for, for the sake of this presentation, VPD uh, is uh, vulva Paget's disease. Um, so, mammary Paget's disease by far is uh, the more common form, um, and of the extra mammary Paget's disease, uh, about 83% is, is vulva Paget's disease. Um, as you know, it is most common in postmenopausal post uh, Caucasian uh, women. Um, and there, there's an invasive form uh, where 
there is more than one millimeter invasion of the dermis and there is a non-invasive form uh, which includes uh, truly intraepithelial disease and where the invasion of the dermis is is less than one millimeter so all that uh, those two categories are grouped together uh, the invasive form uh, makes up around 20 percent of all vulva pagets uh, and about uh, between one and two percent of um, of all uh, vulva cancers so uh, the pathophysiology is uh, quite interesting and there are um, sort of postulations or or three um, three possible origins of uh, of pagets the first uh, theory is that it arrives uh, or has its origin in the intradermal uh, or intraepidermally in the skin appendages uh, like uh, apocrine, apocrine glands um, uh, the basal layer of the dermis and uh, and in uh, in hair follicles, so therefore it's typically seen in, in hair bearing uh, skin. Uh, a second possible origin is that of mammary light glands, which are found in the interlabial fold. Um, uh, and then the third one is uh, is uh, toker cells. Now toker cells. Uh, and that is a more recent um, history uh, has been described as as a possible precursor cell uh, of of the Paget cells. Um, so there is a classification uh, by Wilkinson, um, and to me this sort of sets out uh, the best way of of classifying uh, Paget's disease. Um, so by far the majority of, of uh, vulva Paget's um, are of a primary cutaneous origin and, and they are all called type 1. Um, and then there's a small group uh, where there's actually a non-cutaneous origin. Um, in uh, and I'll, I'll get to the, the theories of how of how it um, uh, how that uh, arises um, a little bit later. Um, so the cutaneous origin is called type one, and it's further subdivided in types uh, A, one A, B, and C. Uh, 1A is the truly non-invasive, so it's an intraepithelial cutaneous disease uh, that includes um, the uh, invasion of less than a millimeter. Then um, 1B is the invasive cutaneous disease, and then there's a group 1C, uh, which is the group that arises secondary to a vulva adenocarcinoma and as you know vulva adenocarcinomas are extremely rare um, the um, the non-cutaneous group um, is subdivided uh, in uh, 2A, which is secondary to anorectal carcinomas, and as you can see, it's actually not very common. It's only about two, uh, just over two percent of of uh, of all um, vaginal pagets. Then um, the type 2B is secondary to an erythelial carcinoma, um, and then 2C secondary to a genital carcinoma. Um, so the one theory is that that um, that the Paget is is actually an epidermal metastasis of 
whatever the cancer is, anorectal or urethelial. Um, and the second theory is that it that it's actually type of a paraneoplastic syndrome uh, where it um, induces uh, the formation of of a of a cancer or a tumor uh, in a in a different site. So so those are the two um, the two theories um, about how the non cutaneous origin um, starts. So the the first thing that uh, sort of I got insight of is the fact that that the secondary group is actually much uh, less common than than what I was made to believe earlier. Um, I don't know what your uh, your sort of um, take on that was, but I was sort of always thought that that it's much more common that, that you therefore have to uh, do a lot of investigations in all of, of patients presenting with vulvar patches disease. And, and, and I will come to how, how we use this, the, the fact that it's actually only a small group um, who has a non cutaneous origin, how you use that in, the, in your um, assessment of these patients. Um, so, you know, there, there's the whole matter about associated malignancies. Um, so we know that that patients or with uh, exomammary patches can present with a second primary within the first year after diagnosis. Uh, uh, breast cancer is is one of those, but also others other associated malignancies, uh, as you can see on on the slide. And there's actually no consensus on, on your approach to exclude other malignancies. Um, the Royal College uh, sort of um, recommends that you should check the breast, the gastrointestinal um, system, uh, and the urinary tracts, or the gastrointestinal and urinary tracts. Uh, the US Department of Health and Human Services they recommend that you evaluate the breast, the gen genital urinary and gastrointestinal tract. So, so there's no real consensus on, on how uh, you should uh, assess women for these um, secondary or associated malignancies. So let's have a look at the, at the clinical aspects. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can, you can see a typical uh, patches of um, the vulva. Um, quite uh, a number of patients are asymptomatic. Um, the most common symptoms with, which they present with include uh, irritation, itching, burning and pain. Um, and what you can see there is sort of the, the classical uh, red uh, plague with typical white scaling. Uh, which is also called cake icing. Um, but remember, um, the, uh, the skin might actually uh, have different shades of white, of, of, of white and gray, uh, which makes the, the diagnosis sometimes uh, difficult. Um, it can also become eczematous, ulcerated or, or crusty. Um, and um, I mean, be, because of, of what you see clinically, there's, there's often long diagnostic delays. Uh, back to the patient that I saw three weeks ago, um, in her case, it was the same. Uh, she was uh, admitted to hospital in Worcester for other reasons. Um, and during her hospitalization, um, a gynecologist was called to come and see the patient. I think she... She was diagnosed with with uh, with candidiasis. I mean, I'm sure if I ask you a differential of what you see on the screen, uh, candidiasis will be definitely one of that them. It didn't clear, and then fortunately she got to a very clever um, and uh, and and wake up GP uh, a GP in Robertson, um, and the GP took a biopsy. Um, which confirmed the diagnosis. 
so another picture, um, you can see here is some uh, ulceration uh, on uh, on the uh, left labia with that uh, cake icing uh, in the background of a red erythematous um, lesion. Uh, here is a, a perianal lesion, and just to remind you, remember uh, to look at the whole perineum, uh, not not just at at the vulva. So uh, the histopathology, which was described by uh, by Sir James Paget, um, the typical Paget cells, uh, which you can see like there and there is a large or oval, uh, a large oval or polyhedral uh, intraepithelial cell. So here you can you can see all of this is just in the uh, in the epithelium. As you can see, the the cytoplasm is pale um, and there's large nucleo nucleoli uh, or large nuclei with prominent nucleoli, which you can't appreciate on this because the magnification is not big enough. And these cells come in either single, you can see some of them single, or in clusters in, in the lower sort of uh, end of the epithelium, you can see them in, in clusters. And there are often reactive changes uh, associated with this. Um, papillomatosis, uh, acanthosis, things like that. Um, so here um, is a non-invasive uh, slide. Again, you can see all of all of the uh, Paget cells, which which here come in in clumps uh, or in the um, the epithelium. Nothing in the dermis. And on your right hand side, on the B slide, uh, there is a CK7 stain done. Uh, so. And I will talk about um, immunohistochemical stains uh, a little bit, which is very important in, in your assessment of these patients. Uh, so all of the vulva pagets will stain positive for CK7. Uh, and that CK7 stain is just to so, show that it only stains positive uh, in the epithelium. So that's a non-invasive. Uh, so here you see uh, microinvasive disease uh, there and there. Now it's breaking through. Now the measurement is not shown, but it is said that um, that it is. Uh, uh, and again, there you can see it on the higher magnification. Uh, the Paget cells with a with a pale cytoplasm um, around it. So, um, yeah, pale cytoplasm. Uh, prominent nucleoli and, and, and nucleus. So this is a, a microinvasive form, <clears throat> and here is a form of invasive badgets. Uh, again, with the CK7 stain uh, done uh, to show deep infiltration, as you can see here. So that is uh, that is in the the epidermis uh, here, deeply invading into uh, into the dermis. Okay, so um, so there are certain stains to confirm patches, and I've shown you already that that CK7 uh, will always stain positive, and it will also stain positive with CEA. Um, sometimes you should think a little bit broader and distinguish it from either a squamous cell carcinoma or a or a melanoma. Um, and if if you uh, if the the um, uh, what you see on the microscope is not classic, you can do uh, in addition to the CK7 and CA, you can do a P63 and a P40 stain, uh, which will both be negative because those are squamous markers. Um, and if you want to distinguish it from uh, melanoma. Um, you can do those three stains, MEL, A, HMB, 45, and S100. Uh, those are all melanocyte markers, and they will be negative uh, again in, uh, in Paget's. 
So, um, have a look at this slide uh, because this describes the common immunistic chemical expression patterns in, in vulvar patches disease. Uh, in the top row, you can see the type 1, then type 2A, which is uh, the the type associated with uh, with uh, anorectal cancer um, and type 2B, which is associated with a um, with a urothelial cancer. So uh, the stains that we most commonly will do here to help us distinguish are those four: it's CK7, CK20. Uh, Europlacan 3 and GATA 3. Uh, Europlacan 3 stain is not available anywhere in South Africa. I actually asked for that in, in the patient that, that I saw. Um, the pathologist did, however, do a GATA 3 stain and a CK7 and a CK20. Uh, so in a type 1, uh, which is a, the pure cutaneous form, it will only stain positive for CK7 and negative for CK20 and the urothelial stains. Uh, st um, the, the form which uh, presents in association with an anorectal cancer will be CK20 positive and CK7 negative. Uh, and also the, the urothelial stains will be negative. Um, and then the urothelial stains might stain positive or negative for CK7 and positive for, for 20 uroplacan 3 and GATA 3. So the patient that I saw, we did not have a uroplacan 3 uh, stain available and the GATA 3 was equivocal. So I still don't know whether she might have um, a possible urothelial origin. Um, so... So that is the immunohistochemistry, um, and sorry, let's go just back to that. So, uh, so this also opened up a, a lot of things to me, which um, which I didn't know before, um, and this is very really helpful in your assessment of the patients. I will come back to that right at the end uh, when I'll show you an algorithm of how to appro approach a patient with newly diagnosed badgets. So let's talk about uh, various forms of treatment. Um, I think the mainstay of treatment uh, used to be um, surgery. Uh, surgery to address the um, uh, the local disease, uh, which might either be a wide local excision or a hemivalvectomy or a radical valvectomy. And the aim of, of your surgery should uh, be to uh, have clear surgical margins. Now, one of the things that uh, this I fortunately did know, <laughs> this was not new to me, is that the microscopic extent of of uh, Padgets is actually far beyond what you see macroscopically, which uh, makes achieving the aim of clear surgical margins extremely difficult um, because you don't know exactly how wide uh, along the uh, or how, how much wider along the, the macroscopic margin you should cut. So there are a few ways of addressing that. One one is by doing an intraoperative frozen section. Unfortunately, that has a very high false negative rate, as you can see. Uh, and it is, uh, uh, and the reason for that is because it is very difficult to identify patched cells on on frozen sections, apparently, according to pathologists. Then there is um, something which is called Mohs microsurgery. I don't know whom of you have heard about Mohs microsurgery. That I've also heard before. So what Mohs microsurgery entails, it, it's actually used for basal carcinomas and squamous carcinomas of the skin. Uh, so what you do is you actually do a surgical procedure in 
uh, in stages um, with a pathologist um, on site. Uh, so th the idea is to, with your first excision, is to excise uh, only what you can see um, macroscopically. Um, it is, you, you then sort of make a, a, a drawing or almost like a, um, a, a mapping of, of the lesion, uh, which is then um, looked at under the microscope. And then you can see where uh, there is an affected margin. Uh, and then you, then you go to your second stage. So, so the patient is in the, uh, in the operating area or wherever for, for quite a, a long time. You can then go back and, and uh, in the area where you see, where you saw um, or where the pathologist saw affected margins, you can, you can excise a little bit deeper and you carry on with that until you get to negative margins. Now, obviously in, um, in pagets, there there are two issues. One one is the lateral margins, but but there's also an issue of of deep margins uh, because um, remember hair follicles and the apocrine glands can uh, be a little bit deeper in the skin uh, than what you would remove just with a um, superficial or skinning valvectomy. Um, but the the most sort of important part is of, of it is to is to look at your excision margins and and you will uh, every time cut a little bit wider a little bit wider until you get to negative margins now there is the issue about the the margin status as as a prognostic factor and and there is uh, there is some conflicting evidence in the literature there are uh, some papers that show uh, that margin status uh, has very little effect as a as a prognostic factor, whereas others show that with positive margins, the risk of 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 recurrent lesion is much uh, bigger. Be that as it may, um, the one must remember that that the local recurrence rate of of uh, pagets is uh, quite high. Um, then, uh, after addressing the the uh, primary lesion, there's the matter of inguinofemoral lymph node dissection, and this is only indicated in patients with uh, invasive disease, so not even microinvasive disease. So, a patient with an invasive pagets, uh, you should treat exactly the same or we should treat them exactly the same as a patient with uh, with uh, with vulva cancer invading to more than a millimeter um, and they should get a proper inguinofemoral lymph node dissection there is not uh, enough evidence to do sentinel lymph node dissections in these patients there, there's simply not uh, enough on that in the literature okay so let's look at um, at alternative treatment options, the first of which is uh, topical imiquimod or Aldara. Um, imiquimod is a toll-like receptor 7 agonist uh, acting as immune response modifier and it does a few things. It, it triggers immune cells to produce um, a number of, of cytokines as you can see there. There's also indirect stimulation uh, or, or production of inflammatory T helper uh, type 1 cytokine, cytokines and it also activates Langeron cells in the skin which enhance uh, antigen presentation to T cells. So that, that's uh, the, the way that, that imiquimod works. So the registrars, you should know that because uh, remember imiquimod is um, also used uh, obviously for for um, uh, for perennial warts. Okay, so there uh, was a, a nice review um, in the literature recently describing seventy cases 
um, of patients with uh, vulvar Paget's disease uh, treated with amiquimod. Uh, the treatment uh, duration had a wide range, as you can see, but the mean uh, was about just over 12 weeks. Uh, treatment intervals, uh, the majority of, of um, patients had a treatment interval of two to three times a week, which is what is uh, recommended in patients with, with, um, uh, with vulvar warts. Uh, 42 of the 70 had primary disease and 28 had um, recurrent disease. Um, and looking at all of the cases, you will see there was either a complete or a partial response in uh, in um, uh, in 87 percent of uh, of um, the cases described. Um, a few had stable disease or no response, um, and uh, the disease progression was um, noticed in only four. Uh, of the cases described in the literature. So it seems uh, that um, that uh, Aldara is promising uh, in the in the treatment um, and we will get to that a little bit later. You must just remember that there are um, side effects. Uh, some of them are local and some of them are systemic. Um, the local ones you are uh, quite aware of. Uh, fortunately, um, the majority of them are mild to moderate, uh, but there will be quite uh, more than half of women that you uh, will prescribe or give Aldara to will, um, will have some of these side effects. So it is something to counsel uh, these women about if you, if you prescribe Aldara. Then there's a small risk for systemic um, effects, flu-like symptoms, fever, myalgia or ultralgia. And in all of these 70 women described in all the case report, reports, only five stopped prematurely. Uh, you might have to either reduce the application frequency or interrupt treatment. Um, so that depends on, on the severity of the symptoms that your patient um, experiences. Uh, so that's why it's important to keep communication uh, with, with the patient. Um, and if she experiences any side effects that, um, that is just too much for her, consider to reduce her application frequency or just take a, a treatment interruption of a week or 10 days uh, and then restart. Um, there are also a few, uh, and this is another um, uh, sort of interesting application of, of it, um, is where it was used as adjuvant treatment, uh, and specifically in patients with, with positive resection margins. Uh, there are about eight cases reported, um, and all of them had, had uh, good response. Uh, without any recurrences. Now, the, the cases that were reported, um, uh, some of them were just given, uh, uh, all, all of the patients were given in Miquimod uh, post-operatively as sort of adjuvant treatment, irrespective of the margin status. But remember, you will have positive margins in a lot of patients. So this is an interesting um, concept uh, to use if, if you do surgery uh, to use it as an adjuvant treatment um, of the surgery. Uh, so this is a, um, three slides of a patient that was treated with, um, with imiquimod. Um, picture A is before treatment started. Uh, B was uh, at four weeks, um, and you can see now there is some uh, redness of the skin um, but just look at 10 weeks, uh, the amazing response uh, that you can see in slide um, C. Uh, what about chemotherapy? Um, so there are uh, different uses of chemotherapy in patients with Paget's. Uh, it will obviously be 
um, considered in patients with, with metastatic disease. Um, there is a small report on, uh, on docetaxel, which was used at, as, um, as an adjuvant to radiotherapy and uh, fluorouracil, etoposide, uh, uh, no, is it epirubicin? And, and um, um, oh, what's the C? Uh, cyclophosphamide. Um, and then there is a small report of, I think, about seven patients that was treated with topical bleomycin, uh, where, where patients with, were treated with two weeks on and four to six weeks off. Um, and uh, this regime was repeated if the disease was not clear after sort of one, let's call it a cycle, um, and the majority of these patients had, had a good response, but that's small, small case report. So what about radiotherapy? Um, radiotherapy has, uh, has a few applications. It can either be used as primary treatment. Um, remember, uh, patients might refuse surgery or they might not be eligible for surgery. Uh, because of um, comorbid disease or whatever the case uh, might be. Remember, these patients are often elderly. Same applies for the patient that, 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 uh, that I've seen now. Uh, the patient was recently admitted in an ICU for, uh, for just over a week in heart failure because of a fa fast um, atrial fibrillation. Um, she's on anticoagulant. She's on hypertensive medication. So... Uh, she's likely not a very good candidate for surgery. Second application might be to treat patients with recurrent disease, or thirdly, uh, just as an adjuvant uh, post-operative treatment. Um, there are uh, reported in the literature about 91 cases, um, 40 of which we were treated primarily in 51 as adjuvant treatment. The recommended dose uh, for um, intraepithelial disease or uh, um, yeah, is, is 40 to 50 gray uh, in divided fractions uh, with a higher dose for patients with invasive disease. Uh, and actually, there has been shown to be good uh, outcome with recurrence rates of less than 20%. Then there is uh, a concept called photodynamic therapy. Um, what happens in photodynamic therapy, a photosensitizer is applied to a lesion. Um, the, um, the proliferating tumor cells uh, will actually absorb the radiosensitizer, which is then washed off after several, several hours, and the lesion is then irradiated with visible red light, whereby it destroys the proliferating tumor cells that absorb the, the radiosensitizer. Um, so that is basically how it works. It, it has wide application in lots of uh, other fields as well, but there is not a lot out in the literature on the use of, of photodynamic therapy in, in patches. There are a few um, small reports. So that brings me now to, um, to an algorithm uh, which I find very helpful um, after reading all, all of this. So when you see a patient where you suspect uh, vulva, vulva Paget's disease, um, you will obviously start with a consultation uh, with an accurate medical history. And here you must think about breast disease, uh, lower GI tract, uh, uh, urinary tract uh, symptoms. So specifically inquire about that. Um, but also vulvovaginal symptoms. So those are the things that you should um, 
inquire about in your history and your examination should include a proper gynecologic examination. Uh, remember to not just look at the at the vulva, uh, but also the vagina, uh, because they might have an underlying vaginal adenocarcinoma and, and the cervix. So uh, don't forget about that. Uh, do a pap smear and then, of course, take your biopsy. So, um, so if your biopsy confirms Paget, uh, then you will ask your colleague from pathology to do um, those three stains that we talked about, the CK7, CK20, and, and Europlacan, or in our case, a GATA3. Um, and those uh, immunohistochemical markers will help you to distinguish the cutaneous forms from the non from the non cutaneous forms. Okay, and I find that uh, very helpful. Then, uh, if uh, okay, let's first look at the right hand side of of the slide. If your immunohistochemical stains uh, are in favor of a non-cutaneous form, then you need to, depending on, on what it's stained for, you should do a mammography, uh, cystoscopy and or colonoscopy, depending on which of those were uh, positive. Uh, if they screen negative, um, they will be managed just the same as the um, uh, the cutaneous form. If they screen positive, um, sorry, I just want to move this up. Uh, you will individualize therapy, taking into account the location and extent of malignancy, location, extent of vulva lesion, and patient factors. And then, obviously. Uh, your, your treatment becomes much difficult and you will do that in, uh, in a, sort of a multidisciplinary team with either your urology colleague or your, your, your GI colleague. So for the cutaneous form, in other words, the patients that only had a positive CK7 and a CA and, and all of the, the other three markers, the, the Europlacan and CK20 negative, um, it is recommended that you do a mammography for them, uh, not because there is um, uh, evidence to show that that it can, that that these patients have their vulva patches in association with with uh, uh, with breast patches, but because we know that uh, about 10 to 11 percent of them might develop a breast cancer in years to come. Then you go and do vulva mapping. Uh, so you all know vulva mapping, so you take the patient to theater and you go and take uh, a number of biopsies and, and the reason why you do that is to, uh, to um, distinguish whether this is invasive or non-invasive disease. Uh, if you confirm invasive disease, as mentioned, we treat them the same as a squamous cell carcinoma of the vulva and they get surgery in the form of uh, a valvectomy or white local excision with inguinofemoral lymph node dissection. The non-invasive group, uh, which uh, is by far, remember, the, the, the biggest group, uh, it is now actually recommended that one should consider a symptomatic approach in, in those patients. And, and that, that, that includes either just to follow up the patient if she is totally asymptomatic or to cons consider or weigh up medical uh, treatment um, or surgical treatment. Um, Remember, the outcome of these patients with non-invasive disease uh, is very good. Uh, and it is um, actually now uh, uh, some of these um, uh, newer review articles actually recommend that one should, um, rather than doing a big operation uh, in an elderly patient, the patient that was referred to me is 81, 
um, and and removing a big part of all the skin is to is to consider um, imiquimod as your as your primary treatment. And to me, I think that makes a lot of sense. You can follow up the patients. Uh, you can take pictures. You can document um, their uh, progress on uh, on management. Um, all right. So lastly, uh, as I say. Uh, the majority of patients with vulva patches have an excellent uh, five-year survival. Obviously, the survival in patients with invasive and metastatic disease is much poorer. Uh, with um, their, their five-year survival is, is uh, in the order of only about 20%. But then just again to, um, uh, to uh, remind you about the issue of recurrences, which is very, very common. Um, they uh, classically, or the, the, the median uh, time to recurrence is about 14 months after uh, surgery or in initial treatment, but some of them can recur uh, much, much later, uh, up to about 15 years. So you need to follow these patients up uh, long term, and again, just to make the point that um, that uh, margins is not really a good predictor of of recurrence. Uh, colleagues, I think that is it. It's uh, a long session. I to me, it it helped uh, a lot to to read a little bit, um, and I will share um, my. Um, I will share some of the articles with you if you want to. Uh, is there anyone that still wants to have a look at the slide or not? Can I stop screen sharing? Hayes, I just wanted you to go back to that classification again. Okay, uh, I'll do so. You can still see the screen, eh? Yeah. There you go. It's the Wilkinson classification. So I'm a little bit confused about 2C. Why? Because we don't mention that one uh, when you are doing your treatment. They want you to look at the breast the cervix and the no yeah, well, remember you you had a look at uh at um the vagina and the cervix which will be by far yeah. the most common but but they are in any case extremely rare so uh so they but, are so where does the invasive vulval cancer fit in because before you presented this we were always told that you must do a wide excision of Paget's disease because there might be underlying vulva cancer. And I'm not talking about vulva adenoma. I'm talking about vulva squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so often you used to find yeah, the, well, the, the, the quoted thing used to be about 30% of patients would have underlying vulva cancer. Okay, but that, Jenny, that, that is exactly what I told you, which uh, which reading reading these articles brought me to different insights. But uh, I'm trying to, because I don't you, think that's quite true. Okay, but, but when you when you're looking at your treatment, your vulval cancers fall into the cutaneous origin. But I'm saying that there is a certain percentage that would fall under the non-cutaneous origin as well. The the vulva pagets. When you're looking at vulva Paget's disease, there might be underlying squamous cell carcinoma. Does it that not fall in 2C? But, but it is. Uh, yeah, but the, they but are extremely rare. Okay. They are not. They are not as common as as we were made to believe. Okay. For the years. Okay. Um. So. So we we definitely don't have to 
investigate all of these patients with lots of uh, imaging and scopes and whatever. Uh, yeah. Because um, the the non-cutaneous origin is is rare, uh, and and um, and they will usually have the, they will have those amino acid chemical stains yeah. that that will help you. And obviously, remember you take your history. So if the patient has um, if if a patient has very prominent gastrointestinal symptoms or or urinary symptoms, uh, then I think you you should uh, you should react on that. Um, good. Anything else that you want to see or discuss? Okay. So then I thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm going to um, stop my screen sharing just. Um, colleagues, just a few uh, operational matters. Um, I've got a bid specification committee meeting. Uh, at nine o'clock, which is scheduled from nine till eleven thirty. So I uh, will most likely only see you at eleven thirty in the uh, in the clinic. Um, so unfortunately, you will be without me this morning or the the largest part of the morning. Uh, I think I'm on for the for the list tomorrow. So uh, if we can do the pre-op around at um, around 12 o'clock. Uh, I will appreciate that. Um, okay, anything else? Um, I'm just, I'm on call for firm two because they're operating on the 13 year old today. So um, when they take her to theatre, I'm also going to have to disappear. Yeah. Okay, or they can just call you. I, you know, maybe go and have a look. Um, good. Okay, colleagues, uh, I will see you a bit later. Okay, I'll see everyone else in the ward in about 10 minutes. Thank you, Ains, for the presentation.